Well, thank you all very much, and thank you for getting me out of one part of the swamp. Um, I, have to, I have to digress, because there's so many serious things going on. When I uh, want to retreat, I usually retreat into college football. Now, I attended the finishing school in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, named, uh, known as Wake Forest University. Uh, the football dorm at Wake Forest is named after Arnold Palmer, uh, which will tell you why we are the losingest team in the history of college football. <laughs> but my son, on the other hand, is at Clemson University, the vanquishers of the evil empire at the University of Alabama. And um, I got a chance to speak to the Clemson football team last year, and I told them that I was proud to have contributed to all of the great records at Clemson's Memorial Stadium. Uh, the most points scored by Clemson in the first quarter, the most points scored by Clemson at halftime. In fact, it was 87 to 12 by the time Wake Forest finished. And um, the Clemson Tiger has a, a tradition where he does push-ups to match the number of points Clemson has scored. And it was 73 nothing in the third quarter, and we were standing on the sidelines, and we were looking for the tiger. He disappeared. <laughs> and all of a sudden, an ambulance comes out of the tunnel. <laughs> and there's the tiger off in the end zone. He's splayed out, little tiger hats off, his face as red as a Coke can, and they cart him off. And coach Algro uh, was our coach. He ended up coaching the New York Jets and then later the University of Virginia. And he had his press conference. And uh, the reporter from the Winston-Salem Journal said, Coach, is there anything you can say about today's game? I said, yeah, we killed that damn tiger. <laughs> so anyway, my son's happy at Clemson. Um, it is an honor for me to be here. And, and I'm going to tell you what you already know. It's an honor for me to be here because of the man that you are so, who you are associated with. There are... Um, times in American history, particularly in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, where giants emerged who were, in their own way, more influential and substantial than many of the people who occupied the White House. If you look at the period from the 18 20s to 1850, three names stand out, Calhoun, Clay, and Webster. None of those men reached the presidency, but they served as secretaries of state, war, speakers of the house, in Clay's case, uh, the, the de facto leader of the United States Senate at a time when it was populated by people like uh, John Quincy Adams and Sam Houston. And then in the 20th century, you had folks like George Marshall and Elihu Root, uh, people who did not hold the presidency but who dominated the world stage. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld fits that description. Um, if you look at his career, from the time he entered naval service, membership in the House of Representatives, working for Richard Nixon, ambassador to NATO, chief of staff to President Ford at a time when this country was a hell of a lot more divided than it is now. And people were actually questioning the efficacy of our system of government. He brought the executive branch together. And for people like my father, who at the time was a senior officer in America's most decorated combat unit, the 82nd Airborne Division. When Donald Rumsfeld entered the Pentagon, he found a military that was broken. And through his sheer personality and his ability to not only walk and talk the post, the American Army in particular began its revitalization, its resurgence that Ronald Reagan took to the next level in the 1980s. So uh, you will find uh, no more, no more accomplished, and no greater American than the man with whose name is on your name tags today. So I thank him very much. So let me tell you a little bit more about 
his journey. Um, and it's, it's indicative, or it's illustrative in one way because it, it tells you how at different stages of your youth you can be pointed in a certain direction. Nine years after he was born, Pearl Harbor was attacked and his father was 38 years old. He was too old by most accounts for active service and he was also too small. He weighed less than 130 pounds. Well, uh, he built his body up. Uh, he drank milkshakes, he lifted weights and the Navy finally accepted him. And then later, uh, after his service and Secretary Rumsfeld went off to Princeton, something captured his imagination. He was an ROTC, ROTC student ready to go off into the Navy. And something called the Army McCarthy hearings appeared on television. It was really the first political spectacle ever televised in the United States. And there was Joseph McCarthy, at the height of his powers, being taken down by a really gruff-looking, rumpled lawyer from Boston named Welch. And Don Rumsfeld watched every minute of that in the student union at Princeton. Then later, at graduation, Adlai Stevenson, uh, the governor of, of Illinois and the failed president, twice failed presidential candidate, uh, spoke to the graduating class of 1954. And he said that if those young Americans who have the advantage of education, perspective, and self-discipline do not participate to the fullest extent of their ability, America will stumble, and if America stumbles, the world will fall. And I think that's why you're here. Um, you're here to dedicate enormous talents to this nation this nation that is still the last best hope on earth. So um, I'm gonna just talk to you a little bit about what it is to uh, help lead the second largest department in the federal government. And um, then I want you to talk and ask me what, what's on your mind. And um, you know, lead me in the direction that you wanna lead. You don't need to listen to some um, recovering a lawyer and politician to dominate the conversation. But, but let me put this in perspective for you. There, there's several numbers. Since the first shots were fired at Lexington in April of 1775, 41 million Americans have worn the uniform. Of those 41 million, about a million um, have paid the ultimate price. As Larry said, in the second inaugural address, President Lincoln's, which I happen to believe is a more powerful address than the Gettysburg Address because as Lincoln said, he wanted to be biblically righteous when he wrote it. Um, he creates the Veterans Bureau. He said that our duty is to not only care for him who shall have borne the battle, but for his widow and orphan. And the day he left for Ford's Theater, the last three official acts of his presidency were to create veterans hospitals at Togus, Maine, Toma, Wisconsin, and Dayton, Ohio. And then he left for the theater. So that is a legacy that uh, we all seek to live up to. So as Larry mentioned, my background has been in national security. Um, I was born in khaki diapers. That's what I know. I'm still a still a colonel in the United States Air Force, but I've also served in the Navy. Um, and this came out of nowhere. And I thought, my goodness, uh, the Veterans Department has been in the headlines for the last five years, all of it bad, and what am I stepping into? Well, I took it as an opportunity. Uh, I mentioned all of those things about tradition and history and it was pretty clear to me that uh, the Veterans Affairs Department is on one end of the national security continuum. We take care of those who have paid that price on the battlefield. We have under our care nine and a half million veterans, 140 hospitals, 1,200 clinics, 
Uh, I have presented to the Congress the largest budget in the history of our department, $220 billion. I'm the only member of the cabinet who has been instructed by the president not to give him budget cuts. So um, I, am, I am the uh, pariah in the cabinet room, but I actually take that as a badge of honor as well. But how do you go into an organization like that that has been downtrodden, beaten up, in many cases dysfunctional? So let me give you what wisdom I can impart about organizations. First of all, surround yourself with people who know more than you do. I'm not a doctor, yet I run the largest health care system in the country. The one thing I do know is the culture and language of service. So I surrounded my, my operation with folks who have been Hawkeye Pierce. They've been combat surgeons on the battlefield. They've served in every capacity in the military from E9 all the way up to Lieutenant General. And I walked the post. Uh, in the last year, I have been in 37 states. Um, now, what is remarkable about that? Um, I am amazed how many times I go someplace in this country and I'm told that I'm the first secretary that they've ever seen. So walking the post means making sure that you take care of morale, that you take care of the people who work for you and tell them that you will be their spokesman, that you will support them in their decisions. Um, at the same time, I also have to embark on the most uh, vigorous reform period in the history of the department, going all the way back to the GI Bill. The GI Bill was signed by President Roosevelt in June of 1944. I, I have argued that it was the most important piece of legislation ever signed by a president other than the Civil Rights Act because at the end of World War II, the GI Bill educated seven and a half million soldiers. That created the American middle class that went on to dominate the world for the post-war period. But in the meantime, Looking at an organization with almost 400,000 people, there's no computerized supply chain. There's no modern HR system. People like my father were still carrying around 800-page paper records that were disintegrating in their hands as they got older. People were not held accountable. Folks who had given us disasters like Phoenix where people were dying on the waiting list were still on the books. I will be, the only time I will be partisan in our conversation, there was an administration before this that was completely indifferent to national security. And not only completely indifferent to national security, but by extension, those who had served. Department of Veterans Affairs was filled with political appointees who couldn't go anyplace else. And that had to change. So, uh, in terms of what you all will be doing as you go forward, um, I have a few piece of, pieces of advice. Never be afraid to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are. But get to know, get to know your organization. Know what the people in the next office are doing. Not to do their jobs, but to understand what it is that they go through. The other thing that I, I preach, uh, and, I've, and Larry's seen it in the reserve component, I certainly have seen it in the reserve component, and in corporate America. People tend to homestead where they're comfortable. Uh, one of the things I did when I first came into VA was start cross-pollinating people in different departments. People who'd been in the, our Veterans Health Administration um, for 30 years didn't know what was going on in the Veterans Benefit Administration. They didn't know how their decisions were impacting that part of the organization. So be creative. Think about where people can use their talents, in many cases outside of their, their zones of comfort. 
But the last, and, and then I will stop and let you all, you all dictate the, the course. Um, I told our people that we no longer have welcome written across our forehead. What does that mean? Uh, I am at an organization where it's very easy for politicians and the media to sound self-righteous. They will take a, a case where Aunt Susie uh, got 20 pills instead of 30 and make a national case out of it. And the people who work for us are pointed to as being malefactors. Well, I told the folks that that was no longer the case, that they would be hung out to dry. If the press was wrong, if the Congress was wrong, I would say something. And in the meantime, an organization that has always been 17 out of 17 or 16 out of 17 when it comes to the best places in government to work, we're now up to six. It is the most dramatic rise of any federal department in terms of employee satisfaction in the history of this city. Customer service amongst ourselves, not talking to, but talking with people, not only led to that rise, but it led to the most important thing, and that is the satisfaction of the nine and a half million veterans we take care of. Our customer satisfaction rates now sit at 89.7%. That's a figure validated by MIT and Harvard, and as well as the Journal of the American Medical Association. And that is, that is probably uh, the best validation of what can happen when changes are made. So um, I, will, um, I will leave it there, because you don't want to hear a, a politician talk and talk and talk. But I want to hear what you want to know about running an organization this complex. How do you, how do you navigate? place like Washington, D.C. But I will finish with uh, words that uh, I usually end my presentations at, at Arlington and uh, across the country at our various national cemeteries. I mentioned my father, uh, gravely wounded combat soldier, uh, senior officer in the 82nd Airborne Division. His great hero was Matthew Bunker Ridgway. General Ridgway commanded the All-American Division to victory in North Africa and Sicily, and then planned the airborne assault on Hitler's Fortress Europe. But Eisenhower wanted him as a planner, didn't want him to jump in with the 82nd, so he had to stay behind in, in England. And as the planes were lifting off, he tried to get some sleep, but he couldn't. And he actually fell out of his cot, sweating profusely. And he reached for the Old Testament, grabbed it, turned to the book of Joshua, the Battle of Jericho, the most ferocious battle in the history of the Hebrew people up to that time. And he looked for the promise God had given to Joshua. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. He read it and then went to sleep. In 1986, Ronald Reagan awarded General Ridgway the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And Reagan said about Ridgway that heroes come when they are needed. Great men step forward when courage seems in short supply. So I think those two stories are a testament to the millions of Americans that we serve, that we cannot fail nor forsake thee because we are taking care not only of heroes, but of great men and women who step forward when courage is in very short supply. So uh, I thank you and I look forward to your questions. And if there are no questions, I can tell a lot of stories. <laughs> By the way, I mentioned, I mentioned Wake Forest. Um, this was, Larry knows this story. Um, so I came up um, from college to work in the Senate, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And the ranking member was Jesse Helms of North Carolina. Senator Helms also attended Wake Forest University. 
and he sat me down in front of his big desk. He was reading my resume. He said, son, that is a magnificent Wake Forest resume. Politics and classical languages. You were qualified to be a tour guide in Rome <laughs> and have long conversations with 90-year-old priests. So that's how my career started. But who's out there? Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Um, pinging off some of the things you said um, about coming to a large organization, and then some of the things that Dr. Cohen said about the acceleration of and positions of power, how do you deal with the time crunch of when you are, the, at time one, when you are not in position, time two you are, how do you organize your priorities and get the sense of the organization and, um, and just manage that in, in, to achieve things in a very That's short period That's a great period question. Um, so I, I mentioned second largest organization in government, 400,000 people. Um, newbie, never been in the medical business other than as the Under Secretary of Defense, I was responsible for the Defense Health Agency. Um, you can't be too complicated. You give them three priorities. First priority is customer service. Uh, the second priority is the Mission Act. The Mission Act is the most transformative piece of legislation since the GI Bill. It opens the aperture on choice for veterans. If we can't provide what they need in a timely manner, or we force them to travel more than 50 miles to get to a VA facility, then we're going to give them choice to go out into the private sector. We also allow them now urgent care. So Mission Act was two. And the third was business transformation. So you pick those three priorities. You give general direction. One of the problems that you will see in your, you see it in your studies, your case studies. Um, private sector executives, government executives, who come in and think because they've been given a title and a big office, they are suddenly endowed with the wisdom of the ages. Now, think about that. I, would be, I, I have seen people sit in that 10th floor office that I occupy, and every day specific missives are coming down that address maybe a particular issue in Fargo, North Dakota, but don't mean a hill of beans in Wilmington, North Carolina. And that, to me, uh, is the key to running any large organizations. You bring the best people together, give them general instructions, and let them loose. Um, the greatest military leaders in our history, and I see the Admiral sitting there. Um, when I worked for him, he didn't know it because I was a lieutenant. Um, you know, my great hero when my naval service was, was Raymond Spruance, the fox. He was not as flamboyant as Halsey and some of the others, but I think you would argue that he's probably the most successful, one of the most successful naval leaders in our history. Quiet, unassuming, gave his commanders general instructions and let them go. Grant, Lee, same Ronald Reagan. I mean, it was Reagan who said, there's no telling how successful you can be if you don't mind who gets the credit. That sounds like silly aphorisms, but it works. So for me, get the lay of the land quick. Throw, give them general instructions and general directions. Let them go. Kick the tires. And if need be, if they can't do it, then you replace them. We just had a crisis. Some of you have read about um, last week. I was actually in Israel last week. I was the first cabinet secretary to ever deliver an address at their magnificent memorial to those who lost their lives in the September 11th attacks. And I got off the plane on Friday and discovered that in Atlanta, a veteran who was dying, ants came into his room. 
ants came into his room and started biting him. Uh, and I discovered that the people running that particular facility never reached out to the family. Um, this was a, a veteran of my father's conflict, Vietnam, 80 years old. And one thing we are about is dignity, life, the dignity of life. And I removed the people in charge. Some people would say that was harsh because it was one instant, but they knew about it and they did nothing to tell that veteran's family that we care. How are you? What can we do to help you and your family in this terrible time? In the past, under union rules, those folks would have been protected. They'd have been sloughed off to some other job. The problems would have never been addressed and people would know that no matter what they did, no one was ever going to be held accountable. Uh, that has been the biggest change in terms of your ability to get things done in an organization as complex as this. We've released 8,600 people in the last year or so. That's never been done. Um, and it's sad when you have to do that, but the safety of the patients and the integrity of the institution is more important than anyone's career. So in that, la I, I did an interview on Fox last night with uh, Shannon Bream. Um, seven, nine people lost their jobs. Everybody from the environmental manager to the, to the head of the whole region of VA hospitals in Atlanta and in Georgia and central Alabama. Um, we have to be held to a higher standard. So simplicity, get rid of the complexity, let people use their talents. If they don't, replace them. Last thing, but make sure you know that, that you're going to take up for them when, when times get tough, that you're going to fire back at the Congress or the news media. Um, back to, in fact, I, I did last night, the Washington Post, uh, the, the so-called fact checkers, uh, did a story about our... Uh, our rate of dismissing employees. It said the president's wrong. The president says they've dismissed 7,600 7, people. Well, they didn't put in the story that, yes, he was wrong. We've dismissed 8,600. But the story was he's not telling the truth. Um, I let him have it. Senator Helms did tell me one great story. It said, always remember this about the Washington Post. Today's Washington Post lines tomorrow's bird cages. <laughs> if you keep that, in, keep that in mind, then you'll be fine. It's a great question. And tell me where you're from and what you're doing. Hi, sir. My name's Ryan Boone. Uh, I was a size 2017-2018 yeah. fellow. Now I work in the Department of Defense. Good so for you're, you. You're an executive. You're making decisions frequently amidst uncertainty. Uh, and uh, I work in a, a job that works with a lot of analysis, and analysis is great at illuminating where trade-offs are, but they don't make the decisions for you. So how do you balance never having enough analysis and knowing everything with still making timely decisions that impact a lot of people? Thank well, you. let me let me just say one thing. He's talking about analysis. Uh, I mentioned my son's at Clemson. He's an engineering student. Uh, my daughter is at Virginia Tech. She's an engineering student. My wife has said, finally two people in the family who want to contribute to society. So that's <laughs> um, Instinct, education. Uh, I hit people hard for not knowing history. And when I say history, I don't only mean constitutional history or American history, although I think that's absolutely vital. Uh, you need to know the history of the organization you're in. What's the mission? What has been its trajectory? Um, where do you think the organization needs to go. Uh, I don't bog myself down with a lot of statistics. Um, I come from, I'm a recovering politician. I come from a profession where I can argue with a straight face that two plus two equals six. If engineers do that, the bridge falls down, but I'm not in the engineering business. Um, no, I, I, I don't have a, a particular system. 
Um, I, I don't look for all, I cannot master all the details. Uh, in an organization as complex as this, that's a prescription for disaster. Uh, I give general direction. I can tell something simple like the press being quiet. I can tell that we're doing well because the critics are crickets. Um, it just depends. I, I don't. Uh, now, in responding to the Washington Post, yes, I wanted to make sure that we had a history of how many people the previous administration had let go, which was pretty small, um, how, we were, uh, how we were moving out in that direction. Um, I do, here's, here's analysis, that's one area of analysis. I mentioned customer service. I am really big into surveys. Uh, most people throw them aside. Uh, I tell people that if you want, if you're in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or Fort Harrison, Montana, and you want somebody in Washington to know what you think, fill the survey out. Tell us about your leadership. Tell us about um, how you think we're doing as an institution. I read it. I read them. General Mattis used to read them. So I, I, I forgot something else that ties into this. Another part of reforming an institution that's been more abound. And this ties into the survey, but it's actually a little deeper. So um, I mentioned serving in the Navy. Um, two elements of our armed forces can deliver the most devastating blows known to man. The nuclear Navy, the strategic Air Force. In the 1950s, both of those forces were delivered probably the two most dynamic and eccentric military leaders of the second half of the 20th century. Rick Over at the Navy, Curtis LeMay in the Air Force. What's the common denominator? They had forces at their disposal where if a slight mistake was made, the results were catastrophic, could have been. And they succeeded in making the world safe. And they succeeded in making sure that an organization existed to prevent those disasters. So I'll tell you how they did it. Rickover and LeMay called it high reliability organization. So well, I'll use the Air Force example now. My, my father's older brother was the commander of the second bomb wing at Barksdale Air Force Base, B-52s. Every day, the squadrons would get together. The squadron commander, lieutenant colonel, his executive officer, his uh, fuel man, his logistics man, his intel guy, his food man, his ordnance man, the senior enlisted, and they would talk about what happened the day before. Not looking at the successes, but looking at what might have gone wrong. Because that's how, you, that's how you learn. I mean, Churchill said that he probably benefited from more criticism than any politician in the history of the United Kingdom. And they reviewed the previous day's actions. Same thing happened in Rickover's Navy. So what does that do? It does, it does what does not seem apparent. I was just in Charleston, and I sat in on a high reliability meeting with the sterilization crew. These are the folks who are paid at the lowest GSA, the OPM, OPM level. And they, I, I listened to them talk about what happened before, the day before. What could they improve? Because if they don't work, the floor doesn't get swept, or if the incubators are not at the right temperature, people die. But they felt that they had a stake in the organization because they were telling the leadership what it needed to hear. It sounds simple. 
but they're now invested in how that organization is being run, and we're doing that at every level. That's the biggest reform that I think we've made. Uh, it's hard to calculate it, but I do think it, it contributes to the employee satisfaction rates that we've seen, we've seen rising, because now they're invested. Uh, the nuclear Navy worked, the Strategic Air Force worked, and I believe putting this in place at all levels at VA has helped us. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have, I mean, the Boston Globe today just ran a, a story. I mean, it thing filled the page. I mean, they, they didn't get enough of Carl Yastrzemski coming back to Fenway Park and throwing out the first pitch. An employee um, stole morphine, 2017, 2017, the employee was dismissed. But they, made the they, they wrote the story and made it, and they extrapolated from that that the entire organization's corrupt. In an organization this big, you're always going to get that. Um, but you, you hedge against that by, by changing the way people think about where they work. We're always going to, there's always going to be a criminal out there. We can't. And there's always going to be a mistake. But doing things like this, uh, lessen, lessen the chance that you will see a recurrence of something like Phoenix, where there was corruption and obfuscation all throughout the chain going all the way up to the headquarters that I now sit at. It's a good question. Who else? Yes, sir. Hello. Thank you for your uh, time and your presentation, Secretary. I wanted to return to your initial uh, story about the battle between Wake Forest and Clemson. Yes. Uh, I certainly don't want to be Wake Forest in the future, but uh, do you have any advice for how I can avoid becoming the tiger, so to speak? How do you sustain uh, a life in public service given the demands and obligations placed yeah. upon you? Um, there is a correlation between athletics and politics and show business. Uh, politics is show, show business for homely people. Um, Bob Dole used to talk a great deal about sustaining oneself in the political arena. And the most important advice that he ever gave was knowing when to leave. Um, you, you're studying Middle East. I was just in Jerusalem. Um, I saw the Prime Minister, saw the Foreign Minister, Defense Minister. I've known some of them for years. And not to get too deep into Israeli electoral politics, but Netanyahu's been around for 13 years. People get tired of seeing you. You have to have an inner clock to tell you when it's time to start and when it's time to go. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. I can make an argument that Netanyahu has transformed Israel in a way that was unthought of years ago. I mean, Israel's gone from essentially a, 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 a marxist light socialist place, economy, to the most dynamic economy, certainly in that region, and for a country that has a population smaller than North Carolina, I think it's number 15 in terms of, uh, of its size. People are safer, even though you still have Gaza and the West Bank. But he's been there a long time, 13 years. There's a reason that the military, and you know this, sir, uh, changes out people every two years, every 18 months. Because people get tired of hearing you. They've seen you enough. They've heard the message. So I think being honest with oneself about how long you should stay. Uh, can you, do you reach a point where you're not learning anything new? Um, that really is the key to um, 
to leaving, actually to thriving and then leaving. Um, I've been told that I have the hardest job. I don't believe that. I think the SecDef's job is a hell of a lot harder uh, than this one. Um, but um, knowing, knowing yourself is the most important part of, of leading any organization and knowing your limits. And it's hard. I mean, people get caught up in the trappings of power. I'll tell you, <laughs> I, I'm not going to name the person, but um, I was at Secretary Rumsfeld's home one Christmas, and um, we were leaving. And I, my wife was with me and our two little ones, the two future engineers, with us. And there was this massive motorcade. And I now watched it. And Julie said, oh, Cheney's here. I said, no, because there's no ambulance at the end of the motorcade. <laughs> no, but that's what, for the president and the vice president, there's an ambulance always at the end of the motorcade. And outstepped, I will not name the people, outstepped the chief of naval operations and the secretary of the Navy. And I thought, oh, um, that was a lesson for me. These guys were tooling around like they were the president of the United States. So never get caught up in the trappings of what you're doing. Always remember there's somebody smarter out there, somebody better looking, uh, who's ready to take your place. Um, but know your limits. It's not much more complicated than that. I still couldn't believe us, but I was, I had nine vehicles, I counted them, nine vehicles. I won't tell you which ones they were though. <laughs> Who else? By the way, and when, you, when, you, when you're thinking about what do you want to be, Wake Forest or Clemson, pick the orange and the, the tiger helmet. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, thank yeah. you for being so generous with your time this sure. morning. Uh, my name is Brett. I work in the Senate. Best part of my day. Uh, you're working in the Senate where? I, I work for uh, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska. Good. Um, I think priorities for policymakers kind of come in two categories. There's the short-term urgent and the yeah. long-term necessary um, and important. Can you speak, uh, one, to uh, how you uh, ensure in your day-to-day -day that the short-term doesn't crowd out the long-term? Yeah. And then two, how you execute that within yeah. the context of uh, a large bureaucracy, particularly as large as the VA? Sure. Um, let, me, let me go on a Nixonian track for a minute. I'm going to give a speech at the Nixon Library in a couple of weeks. Uh, for those of you who are focused on foreign policy, this pertains to you. Nixon said that the hardest part of leading a nation like the United States on the world stage is that Americans tend to think in terms of five years. Five years forward, five years back. Europeans, generations, Russian centuries, and of course, Chinese millennium. Um, that's really insightful because people like Nixon and Kissinger and Secretary Rumsfeld when he was the chief of staff at the White House and then, then later SecDef had to overcome the inertia of the American ethos that we have to do things immediately and we're not looking beyond what we see. So the answer to your question is that I had two, I had two directions. I had to deal with the immediate, which is what you see in the newspapers, what I'm dealing with at the Congress. Uh, I testify more than any of my cabinet colleagues. I think I've had nine hearings this year. Uh, that's an experience. Um, and so I deal with that, and some of it is ad hoc. But there's the other tract. What is important for the long-term stability of the institution? give you an example. How many of you have a military background? The Admiral does. Yeah. So you will know about what I speak. My first day brought in two undersecretaries and I asked them a very simple question. How many people work for us? Two different answers. 
from people at the highest level. So I, I asked him a military question. Where's your Manning document? What's a Manning document? Well, here are your requirements and the people. But we don't have one. We've got one now. Um, those are the kinds of things that you put in place for the long term. You have to, you have to discipline yourself to, to, to sit down and say, I'm here for a short time. Where do I think this organization needs to be after I'm gone? And how can I make it work for those who come after me? The other thing we did, um, you all read stories about the VA hospital in Washington and doctors running across the parking lot to MedStar to get equipment that they should have had before they started the operation. So I, I said, well, tell me about the supply chain. Well, we have an ad hoc system. What is that? Well, last year there were four million individual credit card transactions that purchased everything from radiological equipment to boxes of tongue depressors. How are you going to run an organization that massive where you have no systematic look at how, what kind of equipment that you need, what material you need? So I went to General Mattis and I said, look, I, I need to buy into the Defense Logistics Agency. I'll pay the freight, but I need a centralized system of supply so that we never have these problems again. There are warehouses in the Seattle area of stuff that VA employees bought willy-nilly. Refrigerators, incubators, television sets, uh, pieces to MRI equipment. They're just sitting in warehouses. So supply chain was another long-term one. The electronic health record. Um, I mentioned my father, 30 years jumping out of airplanes, comes out of the service, two new knees, two new hips, has lead in his body from bullets that they couldn't take out from his, his wounds in Cambodia. The only record that he's got is this thing that started, they started building two months before Kennedy was inaugurated. So, again, went to the Pentagon and said, we... We are, this is the one time we're a bigger customer than you are. We're a bigger player in this. And I want an electronic health record that begins to be created the minute that young American walks into the military entrance processing station. And it has to be interoperable. If it's just a scanner, I don't care. You can do that with paper. The reason I say it's interoperable is because of the crises that you all have been reading about. Uh, opioids, suicide, mental health. So in, I, I, wanted a, I wanted a record system so that if I go to the Fayetteville, North Carolina VA hospital and they give me something for pain, and then I go out to my uh, private doctor in Wilmington and he gives me something to help sleep, that now goes into the record and VA knows I'm on a spectrum for abuse, addiction, or worse. Um, so that's the other major reform. And um, so you have to have two tracks. You have to be able to uh, separate in your mind the immediate and the long term. How much, are you ready? Okay. Oh, I'd rather be here than the next appointment. <laughs> um, well, let me, let, me, um, let me just finish by congratulating you. Um, there is no higher calling uh, than public service, uh, no matter what you do. And public service can be in the private sector as well. My, my wife was half joking about the children being engineers. That's public service too, if you look at it in an expansive way. Um, so please take advantage of the opportunities. Um, and uh, of course, if you're associated with Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, there's no val better validation of, of who you are and where you're going. So I thank you all. I thank you all for letting me talk. Politics is a wonderful profession, even if you've got nothing to say. 
Um, you know, sometimes around here, the less they say, the longer they say. But um, I congratulate you and uh, wish you good luck and thank you for, as I said at the beginning, getting me out of that part of the swamp.